It is Friday again, which means it's time for our roundtable discussion of some of this week's top stories. Among our topics, the challenges the United States faces as it gears up for a bigger war effort in Afghanistan, and some new muscle flexing by Iran this week's satellite launch, and word that its first nuclear reactor will open by the end of the year. Russia figures in both of our topics tonight. Once again, we turn to Carla Robbins, deputy editorial page editor of the New York Times, and Richard Haas, president of the Council on Foreign Relations, who joins us from the council's office here in New York. So, Richard, it's uh, very good to see you via fiber. Carla, wonderful to see you here in person. Uh, let's begin with Kyrgyzstan. This is a story that's now sort of exploded on the American scene. Um, and, Richard, I'm wondering, this is a base, of course, the United States has relied on, will rely on more heavily now as it pushes deeper into Afghanistan, more troops. What are we going to do without it? What it will probably do is increase the American reliance on Pakistan, which is uh, at best a mixed blessing because it gives the Pakistanis greater influence, and it also leaves us uh, ever more vulnerable to the disruption of material crossing from Pakistan into uh, Afghanistan. I just hasten to add, Martin, what's so interesting about it is beyond the Afghan dimension, it's yet another signal or indication of the more assertive, uh, at times reflexively difficult uh, nature of Russian foreign policy. So, uh, so we saw, obviously, a lot this past summer with, with Georgia. Now we're seeing this. So it's, it's another indication that getting U.S.-Russian relations on anything that resembles a positive track will be anything but easy. Right. Let me back up just a bit to point out that when we talk about Kyrgyzstan, we are talking about an American air base that has been there for a number of years. It's been used to supply the war effort in Afghanistan, and the Kyrgyzstan government now says it has to close down, just to put it in perspective. What's going on here, though, Carla? Because the Russians obviously are not big fans of the Taliban. They would not like to see them coming into their sort of turf. So why are the Russians sort of posing this problem for the American effort to knock down the Taliban? Well, it, it really is quite puzzling because everyone was predicting that this is one of the things that the areas of potential great cooperation between the Obama administration and, and the Putin Medv Medvedev administration in Russia itself. Um, the Russians after September 11th were quite supportive. They said to the Bush administration, go ahead, you know, put your bases in, in Central Asia itself. The Kyrgyzstan government itself has been complaining that the, that the Bush administration wasn't giving them enough money. So it seemed to be a negotiation over money itself. Then the Russians stepped in, began to forgive loans this week, and said to Kyrgyzstan, it appears that they were pressuring them, said, kick the Americans out. I mean, uh, they've, the Russians have laid down a marker. They're, they're challenging Obama, and the Kyrgyzstanis are happy to play the game itself. Richard, what do you think Russia is doing in all of this? It's part of the larger effort to reassert Russia's role on, on the world stage. The last 20 years have been a time of great humiliation and frustration for Russia, given the demise of the, uh, the Soviet Union, the, the loss of a, a large role. Also, there's been the assertion of this doctrine of privileged interests, the whole idea that Russia has a special, if not quite sphere of influence, at least special uh, influence in this part of uh, Central Europe, in the area of the stands. And this is a reminder. It's a bargaining chip. They can't be taken for granted. The new administration has got to, in some ways, re-elevate Russia into the first ranks of uh, powers. And the, the general approach or culture of Russian foreign policy is to be something of a spoiler, is to be difficult, to be the squeaky wheel that gets attention. And that's essentially what we're seeing here. Well, and there's another area that we've talked about where there could be cooperation on the part of Russia and the United States, and this is dealing with Iran and its nuclear ambitions. Russia is now reporting that the reactor they've been building for Iran is now apparently going to go online or be started up by the end of uh, this coming, uh, the end of this year. So, where does Russia play in this one here? They, we thought they were delaying it. Now they say it's going to start. Um, how do they help us? How do they hurt us? Well, this is the one where the Russians never saw any self-interest at all that made any sense to me. I mean, they're right next door, and it always made sense to me for them to not want the Iranians to progress with a, with a nuclear capability. Um, particularly this reactor itself is not necessarily forwarding Iran's nuclear capability. Um, this is and, the Bashir facility. I mean, the Bashir facility, it's a civilian nuclear power reactor. The Russians say they have a buyback deal in which they'll provide the fuel. 
and that they'll buy back, the, they'll take the fuel back itself so that the Iranians can't reprocess it and turn it into, into nuclear, into in nuclear weapons fuel itself. They'd been slowing it down um, as part of the pressure, supposedly. But ultimately, you know, the Russians make a lot of money by selling fuel, by building nuclear reactors, and by enabling the Iranian nuclear, you know, nuclear power pro program and potentially the Iranian nuclear weapons program. It's a very self-destructive view on the part. The Iranians are incredibly technically capable, and I believe that they are pushing ultimately toward a nuclear weapons program itself, and Moscow, I think, is incredibly self-destructive on this one. Well, they, I think they showed their capability. They launched a satellite, Richard, uh, and, and put it up in space this week, and that raised eyebrows here because many Americans can say, well, if you can put a satellite up in space, you can also use a rocket to put a, some sort of nuclear weapon that could fall on somebody like the United States. Is, is, did that up the ante a bit? It was simply another indication that uh, Iran possesses the technical prowess if they make the political decision to ultimately produce the raw material for a, a nuclear weapon. And that's where, again, Russia comes in. It has less to do, Martin, with this reactor, I believe, than it does with whether Russia is willing to join with the United States and Europe, and ultimately China as well, to put real pressure on Iran not to proceed down this path. But as the satellite launch shows, if Iran makes the political decision, and if the new leader of Iran after the June presidential election, whether it's Mr. Ahmadinejad or someone else, makes the decision to go ahead with this nuclear weapons uh, program, uh, then, it, then it will take Russia and China working with the United States and Europe to put extraordinary pressure on Iran to stop it. And even then, it might not work. That's the real place to watch what, what Russia does. And right now, I think at best you'd have to say the jury is out whether they are willing to play a commercial price and whether they are willing to assume a helpful diplomatic role. So far, we haven't seen it. All right, well, we have to finish, and that's the end of it right there. Richard, you got the last word. Thank you very much. Richard Haas, Carla Robbins, thank you both for joining us once again this week.